Hey everybody, you're listening to the Smoke Meat Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Pittman. Tonight's podcast, as always, is brought to you by Joe's Underground at the corner of 8th and Broad in Augusta, Georgia, and the bottom of the Lamar Building. Unfortunately, right now, Joe's has had to close its doors for this epidemic, but they're just waiting and ready for you to be able to come back in. It's going to be a big party. Everybody's going to have a good time. Uh, They do want me to let you know that they do have t-shirts available on their Facebook page, Joe's Underground. Uh, go down there and get a, get you a t-shirt. They're great. Awesome logo. Helps support them a little bit during these tough times. Uh, really feel for Jeremy and all the staff there because they are closed. But they're being responsible and doing what they need to do. So I can, I can respect that and I love them for it. Uh, remember, I go to Joe's when it's open. And so should you when it opens back up. Going to be a big party. Everybody just... Be patient, stay safe during all this. Uh, tonight's guest is a great guy. Uh, he's played a lot of different things. He's been an author, a boxer, been in a lot of movies. Uh, first one, believe it or not, his first movie was with Robert Mitchum uh, in a movie called Farewell, My Lovely. Played a guy named, named Moose Malloy. Uh, was in the first and second Superman movies, played none. I uh, was in Dragnet with Tom Hanks and Dan Aykroyd, played a guy named Emil Muzz, one of the key characters. I was also Simon Moon in the Chuck Norris movie Hero and the Terror. Uh, he's a great guy. Um, had a lot of fun talking to him. And I think you'll have a lot of fun listening to him. I could probably do 30 podcasts with just him. He is, he is such an awesome guy. Without further ado... Here's my little talk with Jack O'Halloran here on the Smoke Meat Podcast. All right, everybody, I'm here with Jack O'Halloran, a great actor. He's been a boxer. He's an author, all-around great guy. Going to have a good conversation with him today. Uh, First thing we're going to talk about, he did a book called Family Legacy. Jack, what what can you tell me about this book? Well, it's a book about about New York, actually, about the... The origination of what you would call the the, the American Mafia or the Cosa Nostra. Um, my father was a man called Albert Anastasia, who was the head of Murder Inc. in New York, and he was partners with uh, Frank Costello and Charles Luciana and Meyer Lansky and, and a host of people. Uh, and they, in fact, the Gambino family was the Anastasia family prior to my father was assassinated in '57. Uh, they they assassinated him because he wouldn't do the drug business. If you ever watched The Godfather and they tried to get Brando into the drug business and he said, if we touch it, it'll be our children will touch it, it'll be the downfall of the families. My father said that. Yeah. My father controlled all the ports of America, and he said, you're not bringing that stuff into my ports. You know, it's not on. We didn't sign up for this. And they tried to convince him that it was big money. Genovese said, you know, this is a huge lucrative thing, blah, blah, blah. And he said, I don't no, I don't buy it. And then when they assassinated him, they came back to me a couple of years later and they said how, what a mistake they made because he was like the glue that held them together. Because Murder, Inc. was a, was a formidable, a formidable thing that they, that, you know, they, they never killed innocent people. They only killed people within the families that were doing the wrong thing. So it was, um, kind of an interesting scenario the way the whole thing operated and so we you know I, I get tired of watching all these mob pictures about how this is that and this is that and uh, I figured it was time for someone to tell the truth about you know how when the when they all came into America and they first started out how they took the illicit money that they made and they put it back into the growth of a country you know, they, they, uh, my father controlled the docks, so they created jobs. Uh, they owned construction companies. They invested in insurance companies. They invested in Sears and Roebucks. They invested in General Electric. And because their initial earning power was gambling, uh, loan sharking, extortion. So if you didn't have money, how could you pay them? So you had to have a job to get, be able to pay them. So they made sure you went to work. And they were very much involved. And in the beginning, it was the government, industry, organized crime, and unions were all partners. You know, they all watched out for each other. It was a whole different genre of of things until the Kennedy 
era, and things changed, and they started to change drastically, which is very sad, you know. But uh, you know, when I was a young man in, growing up in Philadelphia, we never locked our front doors. People, you know, kids were in the street from sun up to sundown, and nobody ever bothered. And, you know, you had normal arguments and stuff, but there was no drive-by shootings, and you know, people could leave a baby pram outside without the fear of someone stealing the baby. And you know, the neighborhoods were were looked after by people a lot more than they are today. So it's you know, you watch all these changes go down. And so some friends of mine, we sat down one day. We said, you know, it's time to tell the truth about what goes on and what went on and how things were changed in this country. And then, I, you know, you watch a picture like the Irishman and uh, everybody was up with, of uh, Hollywood taking advantage of answering questions that have been unanswered for a long time and, and answering them incorrectly because I knew Frank Sheeran well. He was from Philadelphia. And he, um, he never killed Hoffa and he never killed Joey Gallo. He was a driver for Hoppe, and he was a driver for Hoppe's lawyer, Billy uh, Buffalino. And I knew Russell Buffalino very well. So, you know, a lot of things that are said about people are misguided, and they, it's time to tell the truth. So we did Family Legacy, and we've got three more books coming behind it, and we're going to do the movies and the television series, and, and I think it will straighten out, you know, and a, a lot of – questions that people have been asking for a lot of years, including the Kennedy assassination, you know, and, and I know about the Kennedy assassination. I was there. I was in Dallas that day. So um, there's a lot of things that just need to be put right. So the book is, uh, you know, if you enjoy a good read, you'll enjoy that book. Yeah, what, what I've read so far, I'm loving. Um, you know, I, I love that genre of movies and everything. And i I understand that, you know, a lot of it has to be artistic license, you know, and, but, you know, I, I can see a big difference between when I was a kid, you know, you're, you're a little bit older than I am. I, I'd say by about, well, I'm, I'm 47. Well, I'm 77. So, you know, I, I remember being able to go out and just run the streets with my friends and not worry about anything, you know, yeah. leave the doors. And if, if you got into it with somebody, you had a good dust up, you might get a black eye, something like That's, that. And, yeah. yeah. But you took care of business and one on one with people. And, you know, it's a whole different. Uh, I mean, I, I remember the first time I ever saw a gun in the streets was when I was a kid. Yeah. And it was a zip gun. It was a handmade zip gun. You know? I remember those little 22s. And I say, wow, this is kind of a strange thing, you know, but you very, you didn't see that very often, you know, just uh, every once in a while, something would pop up like that. But it was a whole different, whole different era. I mean, you handle things, arguments with your fist and, you know, so you may use a stick or a bat sometime, but, you know, um, it was just a different, a whole different upbringing and whole different era. You know, people, what, what's missing in our society today is the word respect. Definitely. People, if you don't respect yourself, how are you going to respect anyone else? Yeah, you know, no, nobody, it seems like nobody does respect their self or anybody else. And I mean, That's I see that. Every part. That's really sad. I mean, I watch these kids texting people, but nobody looks at people in the eye face to face anymore. You know, and when I was a young man, you know, you were taught to respect elderly people and, 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 and be, you know, cordial to people and stuff. And, uh, and you better do it, or you got a cuff in the ear. You know, it was a, uh, it was it was a different upbringing. You know, and I just uh, I feel bad for a lot of these kids that think that they they they've got to do it their way, and they listen to the street jargon and stuff. And it's uh, and I you know it's I it's just I I I boiled it down to the one thing that that's missing in our society is the word respect. Definitely, you know, I've got two girls. They're both teenagers now, and the great thing about them, I'm, I'm so proud of them. If they were to meet you today, it would be yes, sir, no, sir. How are you? Yeah. Well, you, 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 you're teaching them fundamentals that people are supposed to bestow on children. I mean, if the, if, if the parents don't teach it to them, where are they going to learn it from? Yeah, because I, I remember my parents taught me that. You know, like say, if I didn't, if I wasn't respectful to somebody, like I say, cuff in the face, you know, boom, you, you'll uh, learn it. You know, it's like when I was a kid, if you – 
you weren't at that dinner table at six o'clock at night, you better have a real good reason for it. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean? And they looked you in the eye, boy. They knew if you were doing any Mickey Mouse business because people looked each other in the eye and they and they, and they talked to each other. You know, it was a you sat there with your family and just you don't see that that much today. It's sad, you know. Yeah, it, it definitely is. You know, it's it's like you know I, I hate to sound like the old man, but you know, video games and just everything instant now. You know, you want to see a movie, boom, you can watch it and. All the instant gratification, you know, kids don't have to use their imagination anymore, and they they've gotten accustomed to that. As like I say, it takes the the personal thing out of things. Yeah, well, it's like this, you know, what's going on in the in the country today with this uh, lockup situation, you know, and and everybody are being forced to be in their house, <laughs> and they don't know how to deal with each other. <laughs> The paramedic, since this thing started, since the lockdown started, there have been so many assaults and domestics. I mean, it's, we joked about it, you know, oh, there's going to be a lot of fights at home when this starts. And now it's a reality and it's not really funny anymore. <laughs> no, people just don't know how to deal with each other. And it's uh, and when you lock them in a room together, you know, uh, people say to me, well, how are you handling? I said, I'm fine. I said, you know. My lady and I, we, we, we kind of like each other. So you know, it's it's a lot easier being locked down with people that you really like and, you know, it's uh, that you're very honest with. And that's the other thing. Being honest with people is, is seems to be a, a foregoing conclusion, you know, you, to to be rigorously honest with yourself is to be able to be honest with other people. And I just, uh, you know, I look at our society today and I shake my head and I, I, I have empathy for people who don't understand the simple things that they're missing yeah when when i was a kid my dad always told me you don't have to work to remember the truth you have to work to remember a lie and that's That's true true. it's it's harder to lie they they always taught me that harder to lie than it is to tell the truth kid you got to remember it all the time you know which how many lies you told it's it it was a it just i had a whole different upbringing you know i just i I just feel bad for them. I really feel bad for people who, who have been left on their own to try to figure things out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, so we wrote the book for that purpose, and I think it's going to help a lot of people. It already has. I mean, I, I remember when I first wrote it, and I gave it to several high school children to read. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and they ran to the library looking up names and everything. And they came back to me, and they said, how come they never teach us any of this in school? Yeah. Because I'm explaining American history to them, you know, where, you know, people just don't, people have no aware. I mean, it's like in our society today. Okay. 10 years ago, they were putting people away in jail for smoking marijuana. And today it's become one of the biggest earners legally. Yeah. And the reason why the government did that for so many years is because they couldn't figure a way to tax it. Yeah. And, you know, to, to me, you know, I, I think a lot of the reason why they don't teach this stuff in school is because, you know, people tend to think of it as the ugly side of life. And every day I see that there is ugly sides to life and we're not getting away from them. And someone once said, if you don't, you know, know your history, you're bound to repeat it. That's a lot of truth in that, boy. And it was reality. I mean, reality is not always beautiful, but everything has a purpose. No, no doubt about that, boy. You know, I, when we were kids, you had you had your grandmother's remedies for for cure rolls, a homeopathic way to to cure certain colds and things of that nature. And uh, and then big pharma took over. And you know, one of the things that people and, and this is something you could ask any child, and I guarantee you, you'll be lucky if you get one out of 10 that will understand or give you an answer is what was the first prohibition in America? You know? Well, part of me wants to say alcohol, but I don't think that's it. No, it's not. In 19, you can look this up on your computer. Mm -hmm. 1914, they did what they called the Harrison Act. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the congressmen and, and all were very much against it. In, in the beginning, because the Harrison Act is what gave Big Pharma their power. 
In other words, okay. before the Harrison Act, they, you know, you could buy marijuana right across the, the counter in, in a drugstore. Cocaine yeah. was in Coca-Cola. <laughs> and, you know, they, uh, there, were, there were opiates that were bought across the counter, but they were never abused. Look, look at love them. I mean, so they was... they turn around and they they turn around and they and they put big pharma in charge with prescriptions. And here's something that nobody ever really looked at. And they only did a documentary once in the early 70s, and only showed one time. Is that women, when when you got married back in 1910 or 1920, you stayed married mm-hmm. on the 30s, the 40s. Women had five, six, up to ten children, and they were housewives, and they were tired and sluggish, and you know, so doctors wrote a script to give them speed to wake up in the morning, and Valium to go to sleep at night. Well, those drugs are going into their blood system, so when they're giving birth to a child, that blood is going into that child, and children are being born with addictions. And no one ever said a word until the early 70s when the, this New York hospital was getting all these babies coming in with crying and screaming, and no one could figure out how to quiet them down. And one bright doctor said, these children are going through withdrawal. Their bellies are cramping. That was the only logical reason for their behavior. Mm-hmm. So they did a documentary called The Littlest Junkie, and it was only seen once. They took it right up, boom, to silence it because... There was too much control in big pharma and the government mm-hmm. with what they distributed to people. It's like the 60s when they said, well, drugs, sex and rock and roll and marijuana was supposed to become the big deal. People were smoking marijuana back in the 1800s. Yeah. So all when I hear all this bull, it's just that people never took it out of context. You know, it's like the hemp, industrial hemp is going to become the finest building material in our society. Uh And it's cheaper and better and stronger. It's stronger than steel. It's stronger and better than concrete. And we're like, we're building a major studio in Nevada, 4 million square foot studio out of industrial hemp. And if I build, I can build a 1200 square foot home, just for an instance, I can build a 1200 square foot home. Two bedroom, two bath, and all the inlaid t- tile and, and fur- inlaid furniture, all made out of hemp. I can do that within two weeks for twenty thousand dollars. And Holy the temperature crap. in that house will remain sixty nine to seventy two at all times mm-hmm. because of the insulation of hemp. Hmm. And if you're in a wet area, it absorbs. There's never any moisture, any mildew, anything. The material is amazing. You know, you you and you pour it like concrete. You set up your forms, you pour it in, you pour it in the forms. Two days later, you move the form. So you can build a house within two weeks' time for that price factor. And that yeah. house will be standing there 100 years later. Well, you know, that's also where they get the, the industrial hemp sort of getting all this CBD oil from now. Well, they get they get the flour. The flour comes off the top, and then we'll take the stalks, and we grind the stalks up, and we add a, a hardened material, and it turns into, and you pour it just like concrete. Yeah. I can build, I can build a 30-story building without one drop of steel or concrete. Uh-huh. Yeah, I mean, and it and it grows pretty quick, doesn't it? Oh, every ninety days the crop comes up, every oh. and it grows everywhere. <laughs> Is it, it and it takes very little water. It was just such that the Indians were doing this. You know, people used to see you watch an Indian movie and they're in the freezing cold and the snow and all this stuff and they're in their teepees, and people say, well, how do these people ever stay warm? Because the teepees were built out of hemp. Uh Their clothes were made out of hemp. But when the concrete and the steel industry came up, they pushed hemp to the sideline. And they made it illegal to do this and illegal to do that. Yeah, more money, man. You understand? Yeah. 
So it's just, you know, it's just, it's sad how ignorance has blinded our society. You can build cars. Imagine your military equipment being built out of hemp. It'll never be detected. There's no metal. Yeah. What kind of sneak attacks you think we could pull? <laughs> uh, I remember seeing a movie a while back. Um, I think it had Wesley Snipes in it, uh, Drop Zone. And they, they were showing what they call a smuggler's rig and all the metal stuff on the parachute rig was, uh, I don't remember what kind. It was some super material they had made up that wasn't metal. But, yeah, that's a realistic thing. <laughs> oh, without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. You know, just to, there's just mind like you could build a car because it's stronger than steel. Mm-hmm. You can make cars out. In fact, actually, Henry Ford did do that in the 20s. Mm-hmm. You can build cars, airplanes. You know, it's it's there's a it's going to be the revolutionary of a lot of things in in our society. And, and like I said, we're building the studio out of it. It's going to be a great display unit for industrial hemp. Mm-hmm. Well, that's awesome. Um, and how big was the studio? I know it was huge. Four million square foot. Yeah, that's pretty big. I'm I'm down here, just south of Atlanta, by Pinewood, and it's a big one. But Pinewood, I I did Superman at Pinewood Studios in in England. Mm-hmm. I know the crew very well. But see, here's the deal. The movie industry is in California, mm-hmm. the majority. They have built studios in North Carolina, in Georgia, in Florida, which are work to right work right to work states. So they get yeah. away with non union stuff. And you can build a studio, but it takes a lot of work to make that studio work. In other words, you gotta have a lot of pictures and stuff going through there to make it work. Well, that means you have to have a lot of technicians. So if you're, and a lot of these states gave these tax deals out. And the tax deal is a great idea. The problem is, if I've got to fly people from California to Georgia to be in my product, and I need technicians to be head up these departments and stuff, and I have to fly them in, it costs money flying them, boarding them, and keeping them in the state, out of state, you know what I'm saying to you? And I have to fly all the actors in. So I'm eating up the tax deal before I even turn the camera over. Now, if I have a problem on the the film, I'm tearing pages out of the script to make it work. And that's what's been happening. So for us, what we're going to do is we're going to build this studio, and then we're going to put a smart city next to it, and we'll employ 25,000 people, and we'll guarantee them seven years of work that they have a guaranteed seven-year contract. So you're putting 25,000 jobs in the state of Nevada, all people making six digits or better. We'll put the smart city right next to the studio so they got 10, 15 minutes to go to work. Whereas in California here, I live in Redondo Beach. If I'm going to do a picture at Warner Brothers, I've got to travel an hour and a half to two hours each way every day. That's like four hours out of my day. Oh, man, that's miserable. You understand? So yeah. if I'm a technician, you know, just picture yourself as a, as being a technician, and you only have 15 minutes to go to work. That takes all that stress of driving through traffic and everything. So when you go to work, your mind's on what you're doing. Yeah. So it makes it very cost effective across the board. So we'll probably be like moving the industry from L.A. to Nevada, which is not a bad idea. Yeah, definitely. I've only been out to L.A. one time, and that was when I was really young, and I, I just basically rode through with my brother. Um, that's a big place. I, oh, I yeah. Just, no, no, no. I, it's a huge area. And, and the deal is that, you know, no one, the studios should have done this 30 years ago. Nobody's put one studio with everything under one roof. Every bit of technology, everything you can conceivably use to make a better product uh-huh. to be at your disposal under one roof. Was it here? What we do here now, we got to run to this side of the city or that side of the city. There's a little company over here that does a bit of technology better than this company. 
So you're always on the go. Uh And you're fighting the traffic and everything. So hours of the day are wasted. That's not cost effective. Yeah, people don't understand. Time gets expensive, and it adds up. Oh, it sure does. <laughs> Quick it sure does. So if I'm doing a film, and then spending $100 million on a film is ludicrous in my eyes. And I've been in the business 40-odd years. And there's a formula for how a fiction will never lose a dime if you, if you do it properly. Uh-huh. No one has a crystal ball to tell you what's really going to work. But the only genre that is real that has never lost a dime is organized crime pictures. Yeah. Even the spoofs make money. Yeah. You know what I mean? So you've got, and if you have a good one, it does a lot of money. You know, you take a picture like Road to Perdition, which is a small little, which is a, a movie about a, a no name hit guy from Chicago with his child. And that picture did a billion dollars. I actually watched it for the first time about a month ago. Can't believe I hadn't seen it before. Um, Very good yeah. movie. Tom Hanks. Yeah. The only yeah. two big stars were Tom Hanks and and, uh, and uh, Paul Newman. Yeah. So, and nobody, I mean, it's, it's a no-name hit guy. It was just a hit guy from Chicago. That's so why I... When I see pictures like the Irishman and stuff, and, they, and people do these pictures about this hit guy and that guy, hit guy, let me tell you something in reality. A real hit guy, if you're really good at what you do, nobody knows you're a hit guy. Yeah. I, I think one of my favorite movies like that was The Iceman. Um, yeah. um, Richard Kuklinski. Yeah, yeah. Don't know the truth to the movie, but it's a good movie. Well. That's why my father ran this company called Murder, Inc. And for years, no one could ever put their fingers on him until one guy ratted it and put 10 guys on death row. And because they never talked on the phone, somebody flew to one city to another. They were set up across the country and they took care of their own business in-house. Yeah. And it was a, I had a funny story happen to me one time. I was down in Nashville, and a guy lived in a little town right outside of Nashville, a suburb. And he came in when he when, I, when he knew I was there because I was doing a comic con. And when he knew I was there, he knew my father well because he was part of Murder Inc. Uh-huh. And he came and I had never met him before, and he came in to see me. And we sat down and had a cup of coffee, and he and he explained to me who he was and where he came from. And then he was telling me a story about here's this guy lives in this community in Tennessee. And he's like the guy next door. He helped his neighbors out, you know, fix a window, fix a porch deal and went to church every Sunday. Uh, He was in the society of that neighborhood and that small community. And everybody knew him. Mm -hmm. So one time he did a contract in Chicago and he was away from home for like three or four days. So the FBI went down to his little town and they they were trying to finger him for this deal. And they went and they talked to like 20, 30 people about a time frame of of this guy being away from that area. Uh And they all said, you guys are making a mistake. I saw him in church. (laughs) He's been walking around. He just he did this. He did that because they were so used to doing and seeing him do that. They automatically thought he was there. They never (laughs) missed him. That's genius. You understand? Yeah. So he had like 30 alibis. <laughs> and he, he was telling me this story, and I was laughing like hell. And I said, you mean, you mean you never? He said, listen, Jack, I knew your father. I met him twice. But nobody, we didn't talk on the phones. Somebody would come and drop an envelope off to me with a bit of work in it that I had to go do. It was in my local area or not too far away. And I would go take care of it, and I'd come home. But he was like the guy next door. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody, you know, like right now I see all these people with the beards and the the Punisher patches on, you know, and talking about being an operator. You know, and I've I've known some operators, and 
if you really are one, like you say, they're not going to sit and tell you about what they've done or, no. you know, even if they are one, you know. You, just, you know, listen, most guys that pronounce themselves to be tough guys are usually bullies. And they're the biggest punks in the world. Oh, I hate a bully. I hate bullies with a patch. They're the biggest punks in the world. And they, you know, and you, take, you grab a bully and, and look them in the eye and they wet themselves. I mean, I, I've been there, done all that. Yeah, I've, I've taught both of my girls. You know, I, I taught them don't start a fight, but finish one. And yep. uh, if somebody tries to bully you, you take your fist and you press that easy button right between their eyes one good time and they'll leave you alone. <laughs> that's good advice. That's that's the truth. That's good advice. You now people stand up for themselves a little more than what they but they don't. I mean, they have these people cyber bullying people. I mean, it's amazing what they get away with. I just you know, and that's why I say guys like like uh, Frank Sheen. You know, he was he was a bully. Uh-huh. I knew Frank well. I had a confrontation with him in Philadelphia when I was a young kid, a young guy. And I, and I was at a meeting with some very serious people. And he was brought into the, he was uh, protecting this guy or something about, and he opened his mouth and, and, um, and this old Jewish guy looked at me and he said, please straighten this guy out. So I took him outside and straightened him out. And he was, he was petrified. <laughs> I mean, he, he went to pull a gun on me. I took it off and almost shoved it up his ass. You know, you just if you're going to pull a gun on me, you better be pulling the trigger. Yeah. You're yeah. going to stand there and wave it at me. you got a problem. No, you, if I can see it, um, we've got problems, and I'm going to deal with that problem. Uh, you don't want me to see it because, like I say, you, you can deal with it if you can see it. Oh, yeah. But if I can see it long enough for you to pull the trigger, then it's over. You really meant what, you need, what you're doing. Absolutely. You know, so, hey, you know, this life is... Life is a funny spin, you know, and so so we wrote the book for that purpose, to try to help people understand certain things. And um, and I think that uh, we're, I tell the truth in the book when you'll get to that. I tell the truth about the Kennedy assassination uh-huh. and, and a few other things. And, you know, it's just uh, there's a, and, and the other books coming will 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 clean up a lot of matters for people so that they can see how the deception of things and, you know, so, but that being the case, you know, one of the things, the blessings about the film industry that are going into it is, is that you can convey a message much clearer through visual and audio. So if you're doing a film and people will see it and hear it, you know, it seems to sink in a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's something. I've, I've been a comedian for almost 30 years, and, you know, I've never done it real heavy where I knew I was going to get discovered and the world was going to change. I just like making people laugh. Yeah. And here in the last six or eight months, I've decided I want to do a little bit of acting here and there. And I'm learning about doing characters. I've, I've got a YouTube page that I do that I've done some characters on there. You know, and I, I didn't know who they were going to be or anything about them until I put on the wig or put on the mustache. And then all of a sudden, that's who I was. And everything I did with them was improv. And it's it's funny how people relate to each of these different characters. Oh, Robert Mitchum was my mentor. And... <laughs> He arranged that when I went to work for the very first day on the movie, and I had only met him at a fight one time. I didn't really know him well. Mm-hmm. And uh, he arranged for them to pick him up and then pick me up, and then we had to drive all the way downtown. So we had like about a 40-minute drive down to the set. And 7 o'clock in the morning, I get a phone call from the front desk. Your, you know, your, your driver's here picking you up because I had to pick up for the film. So I come bouncing through the glass doors off of the pool, and there's Mitchum standing against the wall, and nobody recognized me. He had dark glasses on and stuff. And, and, and I walked down towards him, and he, and he looked at me, and he said, well, this must be Jackie O. And, and, we, and we started this conversation, and he talked to me all the way. He had me laughing all the way down to when we went to the set. And, uh, and I got dressed in my gob and went to, to do the very first scene that I ever did in my, in my life. 
and uh, we're standing at the bottom of a pair of steps. We had to walk up. And he looked at me and he said, you read that script, kid? I said, read it. I know your role, Charlotte Rampling's role, Harry Dean's, I, I know cover to cover. He said, uh, good, throw it in the trash can. I said, what? He said, don't let me catch you doing what thousands of people in this town do, acting. You just be you. You take this character and put him in yourself, and you walk down the street like that character. Mm-hmm. He said, you've been a hoodlum all your life, and this guy you're playing is a hoodlum. You don't know how to be a hoodlum? <laughs> and from the de- and then he taught me how to look through the camera, eye levels, and stuff like that. And, you know, he was a... Uh, he was great. He was absolutely brilliant. He was absolutely brilliant. And I, and I remember when they moved the cameras, for the, we did the first shot, and they had moved the cameras around to set up for the next shot. And I looked at him, and I said, what are they doing? And he said, you really don't know, do you? I said, well, what am I asking you for? He said, that's it, kid. I said, that's all there is to this? He said, yeah. I said, oh, man, I'm a star. <laughs> And that became the tagline on the movie. He laughed like hell, you know. And, and I asked him what the definition of a star was. And he said, it's one word, kiddo, called presence. Some people have a presence on screen and the camera loves them. Some people don't. He said, you can go to a movie and, and, and Marlon Brando will be in it. And no matter what character he plays. People walking out of the theater say, boy, Brando was great at this. He was great at that. Same with Mitchum or Gregory Peck or several actors. And then there's an actor like Bill Holden, who was a fine actor, uh-huh. but he could do a picture and people be walking out and say, boy, that guy, what, what was his name? Yeah. Because yeah. they just don't have the presence. You understand? Hey, you know, like Sean Connery, he's he's played every every kind of accent there is, but he's always uses just his voice. Yeah, Sean's a trip. He's a good guy. I like it. Actually, he's a nice man. I, I think it's awesome. His accent never changes, but if he's playing a Russian, all of a sudden it's a Russian accent. If he's yeah. whoever, that's the accent. And it doesn't change. No. You just, you know, it's just it's, you just take on the character and just do what you got to do. It's, uh, and for me, anyway, it worked very well. You know, I, every picture I've done, I enjoyed doing and had a good time doing it, you know, Dragnet or, you know, be it what it may. Um, and it worked out very well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Since I talked to you last night, speaking of Dragnet, um, in my head for a while, I had a loop of Tom Hanks doing the Amal Muzz thing. And, he <laughs> killing and singing, singing the um, Miranda rights. Oh man. But, but yeah, I remember, Superman and Dragnet and Hero in the Terror. Superman's the first thing I saw you in, and that was so cool. Superman was a good. Was I remember we were doing a picture called March or Die down in Spain, Gene Hackman and I, and they flew us up to London to see Richard Donner. And Donner asked me, he said, "You know, what's your feelings about playing a guy, a mute guy?" And I said, "Because." Um, the character Nan was a brilliant scientist that they lobotomized. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, I said, I embrace doing that. He said, are you kidding me? I said, no. I said, uh, because Jackie Gleason was a friend of mine and he did a picture called Gigo mm-hmm. that he won an Oscar for playing a mute guy. And, and I would love to have that opportunity. I said, and then you, you know, and I read the script, I said, and you have turn stamp as a vicious general. Mm-hmm. And you have Sarah, who's a man eater. And somebody has to relate to these children because you're going to have a big child audience for this picture. So I'm going to take this brutish guy and I'm going to play him like a child, learning how to work his eyes and learning how to move around and adulation to Zod and, you know, like a child would do. Yeah. And he said, wow, what a great idea. And it worked very well. You know, we, we, we pulled it off pretty good. And, you know, like I, I've been to Comic-Con. I remember when I first time went to a Comic-Con and people come up to me and, and they said, oh, my God, you can really talk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I laughed like hell. And, and, or kids would come up to me and say, 
oh my heavens, your, your character scared me to death, but I loved the character because it was like this childness about me, you know? Yeah, I, that's what I liked about him because, like I said, it was I didn't I didn't think of it as that. I just thought of a almost like an innocence, you know, where, yeah. like I say, he's big guy. He's he does what he's got to do, but at the same time, like I say, he's learning everything, and he's he's innocent. That was the whole nine yards of it, you know. It, it worked out well. It evidently worked out pretty good. <laughs> yeah, the movie, the movie did well. We had a great cast. It was a it, it was a great, it, we had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah, you, you may have gotten a little bit of work off of that movie. I'm not sure, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I loved it. Um, now, how, how was it working with the different people on that movie? You know, well, the cast was, I mean, when you're doing a film like that, and we did that for three years, a little yeah. bit more than three years, you become like a family, you know, yeah. and, I mean, Terrence Stamp is a brilliant actor. He's probably one of the better actors in England. And uh, Sarah is a very good actor. And, and Brando is Brando. I mean, yeah. Brando. <laughs> Brando was, was, I love Brando. Brando and I became very good friends because he knew my father. Uh-huh. And he couldn't wait to meet me. Yeah. And it made me laugh like hell because Mitchum said to me, make sure you're down on the set and say hello to Brando for me. <laughs> And so I went down the first day, Marl, the, the first day's shooting were all Brando to get the money on it for the picture. They had to get Brando on script, on, on, on film. So I went down, the day he came in, I went down to see him. And he was surrounded by press people and all. And he seen me and he stopped everybody he went right over to me. And I was waiting for him to get done, but he came to me. How you doing, Katie? I've been dying to meet you. And we became very good friends, and, you know. And he was... Um, and I would go down when he was working. I used to go down to watch him work, you know, mm-hmm. because he was such a – and you could hear a pin drop when he walked on the set. He had that yeah. much respect from people. Yeah, I bet that was like watching a master class when he was working. Oh, he, the guy was brilliant. So he did something that I never saw anybody else ever do. They were doing a shot, and, uh, and the camera had a flaw or some noise or something. And they were going to start, and you know, then he said, nope. He said, you fix it. He turned around, and they said, okay, we're ready. And he just turned right back into the shot and picked it back up again. But he had cue cards everywhere. Mm-hmm. So he came down off the set, and I said to him, well, what, what, what is with the cue cards, man? I said, are you that bored with the industry that you have to? He said, no, no, no. He said, I started that with Mutiny on the Bounty because – I didn't want to make it look like I had studied a script or anything. I wanted to look like I was taking the words out of the air. And I looked at him. I said, Marlon, that's bullshit. <laughs> and he's, he laughed. And he, he was a great Shakespearean actor. And he ripped off like four or five parables of Shakespeare. And he looked at me and he said, that you must know word for word. This stuff, piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I always say, either dazzlemore brilliance or bafflemore bullshit. Oh, he was, he was great. Marlon Marl was a trip. I loved him a lot. He was he was a good guy. And I worked with some really, I was very fortunate in my career to work with Hackman and to work with uh, Omar Sharif. Omar Sharif was brilliant. Jimmy Coburn, you know. I worked with some fine actors in my life. And uh, I'm very, very glad. That Anthony Zerbe was a great actor. Mm-hmm. So I, I had a lot of fun in my career. You know? And Tom Hanks, Tom Hanks, Dragnet was his breakthrough movie. Yeah. But Ackroyd, Ackroyd was a trip. Ackroyd was, he had Jack Webb down so well. He walked around with a with a bug in his ear all the time, listening <laughs> to the guy's voice, you know? Yeah. yeah. He got it down pretty good. So we I had love, a lot of fun doing Dragon. I love how he could be so deadpan and so funny at the same time. Well, he's a comedian. Yeah. You know, it was like watching him and Belushi together was, you know, in the Blues Brothers. Yeah. They were just, uh, they they were just deadpan Canadians. They were, you know, Danny was, uh, Danny, Danny could make you laugh just looking at him. <laughs> <laughs> he reminded me of Jimmy Durante. Jimmy Durante was like that. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, I, I love that movie. I remember watching it um, back when they had the big satellite dishes. I was at my sister's house down in South Georgia, and somehow... 
we got the channel and it was on it just a glitch and that movie was on and i remember watching it thinking this is so cool and i loved it you could watch dragnet 50 times and still not pick up all the one-liners that danny had in that movie (laughs) yeah oh yeah you know what i mean I, i think one of my favorite things he did was whenever he you know, talking about Connie Sway. Yeah. And Tom, Tom Hanks said, you mean the virgin Connie Sway? And then just that look that he gave him. Yeah, he raised his eyebrow. That look was beautiful. Yeah, like she ain't a virgin anymore, pal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was a fun movie. We did, we had a lot of fun doing it. It was, it was good. I liked it. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at it this way. Anytime I can make somebody laugh or feel good, yeah. you know, whether I'm getting paid or not, which I've, I think I've gotten paid to make people laugh three times, but I, I love doing it. I, I don't care if I ever get paid doing it. You know, I'd well, like, it's like doing what I did here. Here in the Terror was probably one of the best movies Chuck Norris ever did as yeah. an actor. And I had my wife at the time was, was on the set. She was an English girl and she was on the set watching me work. And, uh, it was I did that scene where I'm coming down the, in the garage and I'm walking down the ramp. Well, she watched me walk up the ramp and then turn around and come down the ramp in character. Uh-huh. And she said, I will never sleep with you again. <laughs> 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 you scared the shit. Where did that come from? She said, I never, that's not you. And I, I, I just laughed. <laughs> that's Hollywood, darling. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember watching that when I was younger too, and I I loved it, you know, because I I like the fact that once again you played a mute, and you could convey. And I mean, it Simon Moon was terrified. Yeah, it worked out pretty well. And, and you almost kicked Chuck Norris's ass. That was man, <laughs> which you did once. Yeah, we had there was a, we had a lot of fun doing that picture. We, we, it was good. We had, he seems like he would be such an awesome person. Chuck, Chuck is a good guy. Oklahoma boy. Yeah. He's from Oklahoma. Chuck, Chuck is a good kid. I like him. He lives, he lives in Texas now. He's a Texas boy. Okay. Which Oklahoma and Texas are right next door neighbors, you know. So <laughs> not too far away from each other. Yeah. And the funny thing is, a lot of people from Texas, if you say they're from Oklahoma, get mad about it. <laughs> it's it's yeah. funny. Okies, Okies are funny people. Man. They've, I've ever, referred, I spent a lot of time in Oklahoma in the 70s. Mm-hmm. I have a dear friend that has a big ranch in uh, Cushing, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was in a bit of trouble with the law, and, and I laid out there for six months while I straightened it out. Mm-hmm. And I got to know the people really well, and, and the Sack and Fox Indians were there. And Jim Thorpe was my hero as a kid. Yeah, yeah. He the was, he was the greatest athlete America ever produced. There's no better athlete ever than Jim Thorpe. Jim Thorpe was an amazing athlete. And he came from the Sac and Fox Indians. And I helped his daughter actually get his medals back. They stripped all his medals away from him over a, over a, a $50 job that he took in the summertime. And no one ever told him that he couldn't do that. Uh-huh. He went to an Indian school. And, the, and, and the, the farmers up there said, you know, in the summer, you can come and make a few dollars working on a farm and playing baseball. And we have a baseball team and, you know, you don't have to work really hard. You can come play baseball. And they paid him 50 bucks or 60 bucks or something like that. And because of that, some clown that dug that story up, you know, they stripped him of all of his medals that he won in, in the Olympics. And he was like a one man track team. Yeah. You know, Pop Warner, you know, was he, he was Pop Warner said this guy is the greatest athlete anyone will ever see. Because here's a guy back in the days when they were on cinder tracks and they would used to dig a hole in the ground or starting blocks. Yeah. And the equipment they had was nothing like today or anything of that nature. And he was running a nine nine hundred. In Man. those conditions. So imagine what he would have done with all the toys they have today, you know? You wouldn't be able to see him move. He'd go so fast. I mean, he was, uh, and he, he did, 
but he, he did so many events. He did the discus, the shot put, he high jumped. He was, he, was, he did the 100, the 220, the quarter mile. You know, he was, he, when he was a kid, his father used to take him by buckboard to the school. It was like 20 miles away. And his father would take him every morning, drive him out to the school and drop him off. And by the time his father got back home again, he'd be sitting in the front yard wrestling with his uncle. He <laughs> ran all the way back from the school to his house because he didn't want to go to school. <laughs> but that's where he built that endurance. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. He had an amazing uh, – what society did to him was very cruel. You know, and, and Indians – Cannot they can't drink? They have an intolerance to alcohol. Yeah, it's a genetic thing. Yeah. And he became unfortunately, you know, he drank himself to death and because of the humility, you know, making him an Indian, you know, doing the Wild West shows and stuff like that. You know, they they, they stripped him of all of his mouth. And he he played pro football. He played every sport he ever touched. He was great at. Mm -hmm. Baseball, track, football. I mean, they changed a lot of the rules in football because of him. Yeah. So he was just like uh, he was like a one man wrecking crew boy. He was a trip. And they, and people loved playing with him. I mean, they had that uh, football team at that Indian school, and they had one guy who, who was a tackle for him, and the guy had a broken leg and wouldn't come out of the game. That's hardcore. Yeah. Now that's that's one thing about athletes, you know, even when I was a kid, that's different than a lot of people today. And I, I try and teach these young kids coming up that I see that are playing sports and all, you know, they understood their responsibility. You know, they had the gift to play this sport. And at the same time, kids were looking up to them, you know, and they, they would try to be examples, you know, and do like that. That's tougher than a 50 cent steak right there. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you, you're you looking at the athletes of yesterday, football players. I mean, I never walked off a field, but halftime in the end of the game. Yeah. In high school, college, you know, and I knew guys in the pros, you know, they played hurt all the time. Yeah. I mean, uh, Pete Retzlaff was a, was an end for the Philadelphia Eagles. He, he broke his arm. He played with a cast on his arm. <laughs> He was he was crackers, boy. And Tommy McDonald, what a great ball player he was! Oh my God, he used to get hit, and he would bounce back off the ground like. And I, and I said to him one time, you know, he only weighed like 180 pounds. I said, man, you get you're taking some dynamite hits. He was a great receiver. I said, you know how I feel though? He said, man, the trick is Jack, you you got to fall down like a pretzel, man. You just bend up, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and you give with the go, man. He said, you know. <laughs> you had a great attitude. Yeah. But they, they don't have athletes that got today. These guys today stub their finger and want to be out for three weeks. Yeah. You know, I've, I've got a friend that I grew up with and I went through school with him. His son uh, played football in high school, great player. And he got a full ride to Auburn. And this kid, he is doing so well because he gets good grades, he stays out of trouble. He's a great athlete, and he tries to be an example. And that gives me a little bit of hope for the future, you know, because yeah. he, he is a – There's still kids today that, you know, that are dedicated to that, and, you know, thank God. But that all comes from your upbringing. You know, either someone teaches you at home the proper way to act and, and take care of yourself, or, you know, they leave you to learn it in the streets. Boy, you get some bad habits. Yeah, you you learn a lot of things in the streets. There's a lot of things that you actually need to know, but at the same time, not necessarily things you need to put out there. You know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. Well, Jack, I've had a great time talking to you today, and I'd, I'd love to talk to you some more. I mean, we can we can do as many of these as you want to. Because <laughs> I, man, I've I've just been sitting here captivated. I'm I'm loving this. Well, it's my pleasure, and I, I just I hope your audience appreciates what you're doing, and I hope it works well with them. Yeah, I, I think it definitely will. And man, I when like I said, whenever I talked to you last night, I'm like, man, I'm I'm really gonna get to talk to this guy. And it, you know, it's funny, you know, a lot of characters and people 
in movies from, from days gone by, I know faces and not names, but I knew your name and I knew your characters. And that just, that was so awesome. I told my kids last night, I, was, I am doing a podcast tomorrow. It's going to be amazing. And they were like, okay. And then I explained to them who you were and they were like, oh, that's cool. So, but I, I feel like I've gained a good friend. You know, you've, you've got my number now. Please keep it by all means. Anytime you need any, give me a holler. I, I, I spent some time down there in Georgia, Marietta. Yeah. My brother lived in Marietta for a few years. About 40 miles north of me. Yeah, Marietta is a nice little area of Georgia, right outside of Atlanta there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've got some friends that live up there now. Like I say, I'm down here in Fayetteville, just south of Atlanta. A little t- down there, I've been through there a few times in my life. Yep. yep. But that's, you know, it's, uh, I almost went to school at East Carolina. Mm-hmm. East Carolina College. Mm-hmm. Came very close to going to school now. They, but they played a single wing at that time. Yeah. Which was kind of awkward. <laughs> Hot, you know. But, <laughs> but it was a guy. They had a great program. A great coach. I think very close to coming to school there. But well, that was in the boondocks. That place. Whew. I remember when I went down there. The, the first time I ever ate grits. Oh man, dude! If you get down here once all this COVID stuff's over, I will make you some grits that will make you slap your mouth. <laughs> Oh, yeah. See, see, everybody got their own homemade, boy. I'll make them boys soup. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's great. All right. Oh, well, yeah. Listen, you have a great day. Y'all come back and see me real soon now. You hear me? Yep, Jack. <laughs> Take care, buddy. God bless. Be well. God have a great bless. Easter. You too, Jack. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to the Smoke Meat Podcast.